Uh, let me start by saying that effective leadership is critical, absolutely critical, um, in all institutions, whether it's running a hospital, running a police service, or running a school. Um, lessons can be drawn from everywhere. This is my summary slide, so they're all going to be texts like this, I can assure you. Um, uh, lessons can be drawn from everywhere, albeit that the public sector differs from the private sector in that public interest questions dominate, and whereas in the private sector um, uh, the discipline is the discipline of competition, in the public sector the discipline is the discipline of accountability. And um, although we can draw, I think, important <coughs> lessons from the private sector about leadership, and about organisational change, um, we've always got to translate them into circumstances uh, that's actually about public interest issues and where accountability to the public uh, dominates. The other point, of course, is that local government differs from public leadership generally because local government is about place, locality, community, distinctive heritage. Um, uh, Professor George Jones of the LSE once said that chief executives were topocrats. Um, he said topos, um, it didn't mean we were at the top. Uh, he meant that we were bureaucrats of place. And I thought that was a, quite an interesting uh, way of trying to get across the fact that we're trying to improve the quality of life and life chances in a place. And that, so there is, although we can draw lessons from the private sector and other parts of the public sector, Local government has this distinctiveness about place, <coughs> about community, and about connections to other neighbouring places. Um, we're very different from single purpose organisations. For six years I was on the board of revenue and customs across the whole of um, uh, the nation. And the difference and distinctiveness about running a national service across the whole of the country was very different from running lots of different services in one small place. Um, and so we need to always recontextualize the lessons we're learning from other institutions. Um, the other point, and this is a negative point, is that public leadership that's overly focused on gaining and sustaining control is self-limiting and it's horizon-limiting. Um, to gain and sustain control is the very essence of politics. You absolutely need uh, competition and ambition, uh, competition between people with different political ambitions and different political ideas. But actually if the purpose then becomes about sustaining control only, it's overly focused, then it ends up being limiting. And that's the same with um, managers. Careerism is the thing that actually limits horizons because people essentially are met principally end up being concerned about their careers rather than uh, their institutions. On a pub more positive note, I'd say that public leadership needs to be reimagined for the dynamically changing conditions of the 21st century where we are in the UK. So I'm saying we need to draw lessons from other sectors but recontextualise them. We need to be very conscious of the negative traits of leadership that we have in the public sector but also particularly in local government and we need to grasp the opportunity of some really positive uh, ways forward. <coughs> it's always, um, I, I thought about this when I'm regularly um, asked to advise on the appointments of senior people uh, to jobs. And people talk about, very important, we have good personal chemistry. And they talk about relationships. I don't know what's important is relations. You must have good relations between your governance and your management. Relationships is how people get on. We're, we're, we're professionals. We, we have good professional relations. Relationships are about person, about friendliness. Yes, um, I've worked with my, my directly elected mayor <coughs> for many years. On my phone, on my mobile phone, his name is Steve. He comes under M for mayor. I've known him for 20 years. On my mobile phone, he's under M. It's absolutely crucial, in my view, that relations are proper and professional and that they're not about just chemistry. 
But the point about the allure of alchemy is there's a sense in which people think, actually, in a very simple way, magical way, we can transform our organisation simply by adopting some new technique, some new management technique, or some new narrative. Let's search for a new narrative and search for a new technique. Um, I have a list of 35 techniques that you can uh, go through. Um, uh, I won't go through all of them, but uh, I shall mention some of them as I go. But there is an allure of alchemy because it's immediate, it's quick, and it transforms basically nothing into gold. And we think, ah, oh, that would be marvellous. If only we could have this new person, this newly minted concept and narrative, and this new approach, then we'll be able to transform our organisation. Actually, it's much more disciplined and difficult than that. I think the recipe that I think is needed is one that involves the whole organisation and the whole of the community. This is just a desire, just a uh, diagram, an illustrative diagram I've drawn about an organisation. But it could be, um, I'm going to talk in a moment about partnering across organisations. But the key thing is not those elements of the organisation which are about accountability, it's actually about leadership, about behaviour, and about culture. I recently had a long discussion with my staff about the culture of the place. How could we be, have a culture that's more permissive of more innovation? How could we encourage more innovation? Um, we have lots of different approaches to this, and we had loads of discussion amongst staff about how we could create a culture of innovation. What was interesting was they expected that the culture just came from the top. I said, no, we set the tone, we set a climate, but the culture is everyone's. It's how everyone behaves. Um, and the crucial thing then is how do you encourage people to behave in positive ways, both to do their, have responsibility about their own role, but also to ensure that they're working for the public at large. And I think there's, the issue really is about the encouragement of positive behaviours that build a positive entrepreneurial and innovative culture. And I'm going to be uh, talking about aspects of that culture which I think are problematic in an environment where we're accountable to politics. And I'm also going to say how you can move through that. Now, the imperative for change, everyone uses the phrase burning platform. And the imperative for change is often referred to as the problem that we have with the next phase, austerity the sequel, I'm calling it in, uh, in London. We're now doing austerity the sequel. Um, the imperative is about local government losing its revenues. That's absolutely true. I think there's a much bigger imperative, and that's local government losing its relevance. Um, there are many... My organisation is a unitary uh, council. We, we serve 295,000 people. Um, we have a gross budget of uh, 1.1 billion. We have 800 million in pension funds. But we have a net controllable budget of 240 million. Of that 240 million, 110 of it is spent on 8,000 8, of the 295,000 people. Those that are receiving children's social care and adult social care. So close to 50% of our budget that's controllable is for 8,000 people out of 295. And therefore, men, most of the people that are engaging with the authority are not receiving um, uh, half of the money. They're receiving many of the services. And for them, an awful lot of our services have declining relevance. That's not the case with the people we're providing services for on an hour by hour, day by day basis. But for many of the, of the communities that we serve, and many of the people we're serving, actually they look at us and think we're living in the 20th century. We need to move quicker. Now, um, in the corporate world, uh, Jim Collins uh, wrote a very good book about how the mighty fall, and he said there's various stages of rise and fall. So the first stage is hubris born of success. You make a bit of success, you know, let's do a bit more of this, we'll become a bit hubristic, 
And then he, he then says the second stage is the undisciplined pursuit of more. Doing more of the same thing. We're very good at doing this. Let's do more and more and more of it. Um, I'm currently, this is, this is currently the, um, uh, the let's take in everyone's washing uh, approach to shared services in London at the moment. Everyone seems to want to take in other people's washing. By definition, we, we can't be taking in everyone's washing. Someone's got to be... Anyway. Um, the third stage is what he calls the denial of risk and peril. Um, in his book, it's really all about corporate failure uh, in America. And then he says there's a stage where people have gone beyond that and they've realised that actually, oh my goodness, there's the grasping um, for salvation. And finally, there's the capitulation to irrelevance or death. This is the natural cycle in the corporate world. Now, many of the services that we're providing in my part of London are housed in facilities that were designed in the 19th century. We've shaped the services in the 20th century and we're desperately trying to work out how to convert them to 21st century needs. Um, you know, literally, and the cl most classic example of this is libraries, which I've, um, I've written on at some length, probably too much length, in the uh, paper that you have, um, which is about how do we bring, um, essentially, uh, knowledge and ideas, and what is the, the emancipating and liberating uh, opportunities of greater knowledge to people other than through uh, conventional approaches. Um, what we're facing, of course, is, is not just austerity, but it's growth. It's growth and austerity. Um, of course, there's population growth and change, there's relative competitiveness and productivity, and there's differential economic growth. There's differential economic growth between, um, uh, well, uh, Europe was 25% of global GDP five years ago. Europe will be 14% of global GDP 15 years time. So there's differential economic growth. A lot of it isn't happening in Europe. It's happening somewhere else. And within Europe there's differential economic growth. And within the UK there's differential economic growth. And within Wales there's differential economic growth. And it's coming to terms and understanding that and saying, okay, how does this link to population change and the dynamism of the communities that we serve? But there's also austerity, reduced spending, revising priorities, redesigning services, and resetting expectations. Whose expectations have to be reset? The professionals, the politicians, the service users, and citizens. Everyone's. Um, because we're changing the nature, essentially, of the local state. Um, but we're not doing it in a, um, in a, we're tending to think about doing it in an incremental way. Um, what that does is it, it disturbs the, the public when they're looking at just incremental changes because they can't see where it's heading. Um, I just wanted to, to do a couple of things on this differential growth because I was looking at some numbers from Wales. This is uh, jobs in Wales in the public sector and the private sector. That's what's happened since the recession. It's gone down by 7.4% in the public sector. In the rest of the UK, it's gone down by 5%. Um, in um, uh, the private sector, it's gone up by 0.5%. Uh, in the rest of the UK, it's gone up by 6.2%. So if you look at percentage increase in private sector jobs 2008 to 2014, that is the difference. Which is why I said in my note that there's a Essentially, 144 new jobs have been created in London for every 1,000 private sector jobs were there before, whereas only five in Wales. Um, so there's considerable, and this is a concomitant, really, of the rurality of Wales, much of, much of Wales. Um, and a problem about economic growth and turning economic growth around. Um, absolutely crucial issue, I think. 36%. Um, 36%, uh, Tony Travers is uh, famous for saying that uh, uh, the British want 
European levels of public services, uh, American levels of taxation. And 36% is the most uh, that's been gained in tax revenues by any uh, chancellor since Norman Lamont in terms of 36% of GDP. In France, it's 44%. In Germany, it's 41 In Italy, it's 41 uh, We have a low tax base, and there's no sign of this going up. Um, uh, the difference in the last election was 1.5 percentage points. Um, it wasn't 4 or 5%. A lot of the time, we think about um, public services, but actually, the truth is that the level of re revenues coming into the public exchequer is no more 36%, and that's the actual number. Um, it's 34.2%. You don't take into account interest and dividend and receipts and other receipts. So the council tax is 1.4, which is about the same as fuel duties. I often say that uh, people that fill up their cars in Lewisham are paying more uh, to the local uh, public services than we get getting for the council tax. So I want to mention that our largest <coughs> business rate player uh, in Lewisham um, is above the bowling alley behind the police station and they pay us £4 million pounds a year. It's Virgin Media and uh, Virgin Media pay it because it's the accounts office for all the fibre optic cable across London. Only uh, Boris Johnson has just introduced, as you'll know, a, a, a levy for Crossrail, and Virgin Media are looking at trying to um, uh, relocate their accounts office uh, in order to Norfolk, I think. And we're currently discussing with them whether we can um, sustain them in the area. So the idea that business rates are about fixed locations, no, not necessarily. Um, they are very fluid and very liquid. There's, we're actually subject, I think, in the public sector, particularly uh, in local government, but I think in the wider public sector, subject to a really big squeeze from four different directions. The first is this dynamic and fluid movement of needs and demands. Uh, secondly, um, an immense technical progress as well as social acceleration. Social acceleration is the increasing pace of life, the fact that time is money, the increasing economic change, um, and just the sheer uh, change across generations. Give me, I'll give you a couple of facts about that. Actually, I'll give you an insight. I seem to, every year passes a week, so I seem to lose a week. Um, uh, every year, I'm now at 34 weeks of the year, I think now. Um, I don't know how many, how many weeks you're at. But um, uh, it does seem to speed up. Um, but let me give you a fact. Working class women in London are having children at the age of 21, on average. Middle class women at the age of 35. That means for every century, there are three middle class generations and five working class generations. We've never had this before. Um, the massive social and economic changes, and it's this accelerated uh, demand on uh, all, all of the, uh, both private and public services and goods, uh, are things that we need to be able to respond to. The other is the character of work is changing. The idea of hierarchical, command-based uh, organisations uh, when people want to work in networked organisations. I was talking to someone only um, yesterday whose son has given up working in local government because he's sick to death of Prince too. Um, I'm not, you know, I mean, how many, how many business cases have strangled the life out of innovative people? Um, people that have done, all the bright people that come into local government who've said, go into commissioning, go into program management, and print, you know, and strangle the life out of them. Um, people don't, they want fast-paced work, they want innovative work, they want to be able to contribute. I work with lots of people in, um, so I did an exercise for uh, uh, the Design Commission, the Design Council on social entrepreneurs and service design and social innovation. And lots and lots of young people wanted to set up their own businesses, work in niche organisations as social entrepreneurs. 
in my generation, we joined the state to try to do that. Now people are joining small organisations. The character of work is changing. As is the nature of organisations, we're much more boundaryless. The chief executive of the hospital in Lewisham is a close colleague and ally. As is the Met Police commander. They're semi-detached members of we're we're semi-detached members of one another's management teams. Um, we don't have to have strategic discussions and strategic plans and have people at different levels operating with you know coded and cascaded permission. We're much more boundaryless networked partnerships than we were several years ago. Um, I think there has to be this question for local government. It certainly is the case in, in London. And I'll just give you some, um, uh, some well, there's some oddities, really, about f facts. But uh, New York um, has, I think, seven boroughs and a very large uh, central uh, New York City. We have 32 London boroughs for a population of 8.6 million. Um, uh, are we too big? Are we too big for the small things? A sense of connection, civic identity. I guess we are. I live in Blackheath, um, I don't, you know, which happens to be in Lewisham. Um, but people ask me. I say I live in London. Whereabouts? I say Blackheath. Um, you don't say the barracks is meaningless. Um, but London isn't meaningless. Now Birmingham is now looking at uh, reducing the number of councillors because uh, following the Curse Lake review into Birmingham, Birmingham's population of 1.1 million has 120 councillors. And they said there should be less, should be going down to 100. Um, I don't know how those discussions have gone. Um, well, four London boroughs, Lambeth, Southwark, Lewisham and Greenwich are four London boroughs, population of exactly the same, 1.1 million. We have 240 councillors. So we have twice as many. Um, we actually have four leaders and four cabinets as well, and four management groups. So, um, so maybe there's an uh, oddity there. But then let's think of this. Hertfordshire, I tried to find a county of exactly 1.1 million, there is one. Hertfordshire, 1.1 million, has 540 councillors. Now, do you think there's four times as much politics to be done in Hertfordshire as Birmingham? I, mean, I, I personally don't, but, uh, but that's the legacy of the past. And it's trying to bring some um, uh, people to think about the past. And that's because it's got one county and ten districts. I haven't counted the 111 parish councils, by the way, that there are in Hertfordshire. Um, but essentially, um, the political geography of the nation was set in the 19th century and doesn't meet the economic geography of the 21st. Um, we need really to be thinking about, I think, the license that we have to operate as public institutions, particularly in local government. We don't just exist and then that's it and then we tell people, well, we're legitimate and we're very good and so therefore take notice of us. Every day and every week we have to build consent with the public through a sort of license to operate, really. I mean, last night in my council, we had 150 people protesting about some uh, service redesign and cuts that we were doing for services to people with learning disabilities. 150 people. And it's difficult. Damn difficult. Um, you can only make these changes if you're doing so in a context where the public give you a <coughs> license to operate. Um, and that's really about democratic legitimacy, which is Electoral competition, is it healthy? Is electoral competition healthy in a place? Is uh, a focus on building consent? But actually, critically, managing dissent is more important in the current age. And I'll uh, come back to that in a moment. But I think that managing dissent in a way where the people who dis disagree feel actually their disagreements have been listened to at least I don't agree with what they've done, but at least I was listened to. Um, at least they took account, they had regard. It wasn't um, uh, tokenistic, manipulative consultation exercise. Um, but it's not only good just having been democratically legitimate, you've also got to be managerially competent. 
Um, a managerial competence is about credibility, capacity, capability <coughs> and confidence. People focus a lot on the capacity of local government in England. I think we have enough capacity. What we don't have is adequate capabilities. We don't have enough commercial acumen uh, for managing suppliers. Um, I think the biggest crisis in English local government was the collapse of Southern Cross homes. And there were 25,000 people living in these homes. And they collapsed despite the fact that every social care authority had strategic commissioning for social care. Nobody understood the model that the, that the supplier was doing. And the model was a, was a demerger between one company that owned the premises and another that was doing the operating. What that meant was that the company doing the premises was, on a, it was demanding an increase in rent roll and essentially was uh, using that to get revenue from the operating company. And so on a turnover of a billion, it was making 30 million net loss a year and went under. And I think we still yet to learn the full lesson of Southern Cross and what that means for other suppliers into the uh, public sector. Um, local government, the idea of local government is that it's an economy of scope. That lots of different things are done to the same population. And that by doing different things to the same population, an economy of scope occurs. That's the, that's the economic theory. What we're seeing, though, at the moment, I think we're seeing it in hospitals, um, in, in particular we're seeing it in universities, is economies of scale. People want high quality, <coughs> reliable, safe services. And they want, you know, you want to know if the person doing your operation this Friday, his, his last one wasn't last Friday, you know, he's the, the person doing it, the woman or man doing it, are doing lots of them a day, um, reliably, safely. What that means is specialisms are standardised at scale. Now we have um, specialists that are only three miles apart in London. Literally, uh, functional specialists three miles apart. And we're increasingly finding that we're reliant on what we're calling single person dependency. People that are managing pension funds, managing payroll, managing this, and actually we think, hold on, it's too fragile. And we're moving to a system now where we are very anxious about the frailty of our organisations. And so we're thinking perhaps we need to move much more uh, differently, not just to merging organisations, but to sort of thinking about um, how we manage these specialisms across uh, authorities. Because economies of scale are dominating in the modern world. There are, of course, economies of flow and penetration, but that's uh, something else. Um, the performance for local government is different from performance in the public sector, more generally, because we're not just improve securing value services, we're doing these other two things. We're doing it in three dimensions, we're improving services. We're also trying to um, uh, improve the place and the locality. And we're also trying all the time to make our democracy uh, more relevant, more connected, more vital. So it's not just representative um, connections, there's also associative, there's also direct and deliberative. Um, so we're doing that in lots of different ways. So given all that, what's to be done? Someone once said. What's to be done? Well, I think we do need to reimagine our leadership for a changing context, as I've said. The orthodox approaches are these. This is what we did when we had the Audit Commission pouring all over us. Um, basically, I remember when the Audit Commission did this, I remember saying to Andrew Foster and then uh, uh, Steve Bundred that um, for every now biter that they employed, um, I would employ a bedwetter. Um, in other words, for every neurotic person you've got pouring over my failings, I'll employ someone else to make sure we've got it right. And it was a sort of war of the nail biters and the bedwetters over about six years in English local government. And there was a real convergence towards practice. People thought it's better to copy than to learn, because you can do it quicker. The trouble is it doesn't become embedded. It's not real. When you're just dressing up for the purpose of inspection, it's not real. It's like when you're young and you get married and your in-laws come round and you clean the bathrooms and toilets. And then you realise, actually, you should be cleaning them anyway. 
<laughs> what, you should wait till they come around. We're doing it anyway. And that sort of ethic, which isn't to impress others, is to make the thing done properly in the first place. It's important. And we had all these approaches of strategic planning and control, risk management, all these things, improved public service coordination. We had lots of improved public service, total place. I said we used to meet together to discuss the gaps. What were the gaps? Because public service professionals love to identify need in order to meet it. Whereas actually we should, be met, we should have been meeting about the overlaps to identify duplication, waste and inefficiency. But we didn't. So the total place resulted in spending more rather than spending less. Um, I think this is the best model myself. Um, uh, ambitious leadership requires productive paranoia. Productive paranoia means being hypervigilant to changes in your operating environment. Not actual paranoia, um, productive paranoia. Being hypervigilant. How is it changing? I'm, I, we're very anxious in Lewis and we don't know enough about our communities. And we're always thinking uh, it's changing at such a pace we need to know more about the changing nature of our community. Um, uh, and where they work and how they work and what life's like. Because it's so easy when you're doing strategy to retreat from the street and just read the, do read the documents. The key thing is you understand the pulse and dynamism of the place. The empirical creativity is about practical experimentation. Nothing more complicated than trial and error. Um, we have um, uh, approaches where we say we're going to do some new things Let's do three new things, and at the end of 12 months, we're going to stop the worst, least effective of the three things. People go, how are we going to do that? I said, I don't know. I don't know. But we're going to find some evidence, because otherwise you're just doing things, hoping that they're going to work. You might as well drop the money out of a helicopter over Deptford. Um, <laughs> It might have a better distributional impact um, than anything we could dream of. But literally, you've got to have this sense of trial and error, practical experimentation, based on creative approaches. Uh, it's absolutely crucial. But then you do so with fanatic discipline. And discipline isn't just compliance to a way of doing it. It's discipline in relation to your values, your goals, your performance standards and methods. We haven't changed our mission since 1988. And it's, it's quite boring. I've been chilling for a long time. And I, you know, I say the same thing. We're, we're about improving the quality of life and the quality of life chances in this part of London. We're trying to make this the best place in London to live, work and learn. That's it. Now, the truth is, people outside of local government they, they can't have mission statements as, as, or, or value directions as encapsulating as that. We've actually got it quite easy in local government. We're improving life and life chances in this part of the world. Um, and we've got to stick to it and stick to it and stick to it. Not just adopt and move with uh, fashionable nostrums. And design, I think, is a useful... Uh, uh, design thinking is a useful thing technique to use. One, because it visualises change rather than relies on strategy. Um, people can think about, ah, that's what it is. So we ask people to draw the future, to draw what they want to achieve. Um, uh, we involve lots of people in um, uh, designing. It starts with the user experience, but also it differentiates between three approaches to utility, when I think it's absolutely crucial in the public sector. Um, functional utility is the chair you're sitting on. You know, does it, is it functional? Emotional utility is how does it make you feel? That might make you feel a bit uh, at the moment. <laughs> but, um, but how does it make you feel? And social, social utility is how does it make you look compared to others? Now, a lot of private sector goods and services 
particularly the luxury end, are all about social utility. If you buy this, you'll look good compared to other people. Public sector is not about social utility. But it is about emotional utility. But what do people feel when they've experienced our services? Do they feel that they've been engaged with empathy? Do they feel happy? What's the feeling when they're voting? You know, literally, if you think about the voting experience as someone, I'm, I'm, a return, I'm the regional returning officer for London, you think about the voting experience, basically, when people go in to vote, we put signs up everywhere to say, if you do this, we'll arrest you. Um, you know, literally, it's to put people off. It's not to encourage a contribution of citizens. So we have to think much more about the emotional utility of the services we're providing. How is it making people feel once they've experienced it? Um, the other point, I think, which is absolutely crucial and useful in relation to design, is that it enables fast learning. Um, I used to use for many years a quote from Rosabeth Moss Cantor, uh, which was, um, uh, every success that was a failure in the middle. The trouble is, you can only use that for so long, because it was, and they said, well, you used that three months ago. Said, well, we're still in the middle. Um, uh, well, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Don't worry. The, you know, we're, we're def this is definitely going to work. What prototyping does enables you <coughs> to test things quickly, in a fast way, um, and learn from them. And I think this is one of the difficulties in local government, is that we're unable to learn from error because we can't publicise our error very well. I've never been able to introduce a mistake of the month competition. I've tried to. Uh, the mayor said, well, it's a good idea. Quite like this idea, but it's like writing. I said, well, wait, oh. I said, if I do the first mistake, you do the second one. Um, uh, he said, well, but the trouble is, it will be a weekly column um, in the papers about the mistakes in the council. Um, so, but leadership roles, I think, we. What we think of them is that they're about intellectual energy, they're about setting direction, building capability, maintaining momentum, encouraging confidence. As soon as those last two words are there, you realise that it's not about intellectual energy, it's actually emotional labour. An awful lot of leadership is emotional labour. Um, and a lot of it, I don't know if you're familiar with the monkey on the shoulder, the uh, phrase that people come in with a monkey on their shoulder in the meeting and the purpose of the meeting is for them to take it off their shoulder, put it onto yours and, uh, uh, and then the next meeting and, then, and uh, by the end of the day you've got about 95 monkeys on your shoulder. Um, the whole pur purpose of uh, organisations really is to share uh, emotion purposefully so that organisation can amplify the efforts of individuals and that more can be done. Um, organisations are much more like cakes than cars. If a car, if a Toyota is, is built, the first person that buys it, is merely, the minute it goes out the, um, the production line, is Honda. They deconstruct it and reconstruct it again. Because it can be. Because it's engineered to a blueprint. Organisations aren't engineered to blueprints. They can't be. Um, you, they can have similar practices, but I can't use the same practice that's used in um, uh, Cornwall or Coventry or Camden, because I don't have their people. I have my people. They work differently. Organisations are, are built on like recipes, much more so than they're blueprinted. They're not engineered, they're socially constructed by the people in them. And you can feel the nature of them when you go there. You can feel what it's like. You can feel the energy. You can feel the sense of the place. They're socially constructed. They're not just a diagram. Um, so what are my eight ingredients? Well, the first is to root out bad practice. The first thing you must do, and I got this because my, my, all of my career really was based on not being like Lambeth where I worked in the early 1980s for two years. Uh, it's not about chasing good practice, it's about rooting out bad practice. It's the first thing you've got to do. Um, and dysfunctional relationships. 
that they can exist within managers, within suppliers, within politics, between them. Where is the dysfunction and root it out? Because you cannot create positive, purposeful organisations if you've got basically uh, dysfunction embedded within it. Because people know, they talk about it. Think about the word, the phrase knowledge sharing and then the phrase gossip. Yeah. Knowledge sharing is sharing information about things that's, to, that's probably objectively true. Gossip is basically talking about people in a negative way that's probably not true. Think how much time is spent gossiping as opposed to knowledge sharing. What is it people like doing? Uh, we've got to lead the organisations that are made of people, they're socially constructed, try and root out the bad practice. Um, uh, the Pope um, get, has given 15 diseases or ailments of leadership um, in his talk to the uh, Roman Curia at the Va in the Vatican in last December. Um, I've got all 15 if you're interested, but I thought I'd give you these, these, just these two. The first was mental and emotional petrification. Um, this uh, basically is being stone-hearted, if you think about it. That's what petrification, I suppose, means. He said that... Um, uh, and this is, he, this is his edict about the problems about leadership in the Vatican. So if they have it in the Vatican, my guess is some councils may have stone <laughs> Um The other is what we call existential schizophrenia, which is that people lose contact, the leader lose contact with the people and spend their time in excessive busy busyness about bureaucracy, bureaucratic matters in meetings. Let's forget all this stuff about people. Let's go a bit into meetings again. So much more comfortable. Um, I can wait for my time to speak rather than have, actually have a discussion. Um, uh, then there's sustained sense of dissatisfaction with local outcomes. This is my second uh, ingredient. And I think purposeful change only happens according to this formula. And the formula is agreement on goals and agreement on next steps. Everyone says that's what we have to have. Let's have an agreement on goal and agreement on next steps. And if we have those two things, change will happen. The trouble is, nobody really agrees with you. They're just saying they're agreeing. No one really is going to do these next steps. They just say they're going to do it. So what you have to do is make them dissatisfied with current reality. <coughs> because if people aren't dissatisfied with the current reality, they simply won't change. And that is one of the big problems about leadership, is you've got to accentuate the positive while making people dissatisfied with how things are now. Is this care home good enough for their mum? Is this school good enough for their kids? Is this community good enough for them to live in? You know, put it in those sorts of ways. Um, absolutely crucial that people are dissatisfied in order that that fuels in them an intrinsic need to want to change. Otherwise, they're just in a meeting listening and they're agreeing while you're there. Um, I'm not going to go through these. There's any greater of these, I would say. These are the next ones, which are about designing accountabilities, about openness between governance and management, um, mapping out ambitions, priorities, and goals. And this fourth one is really from Michael Barber's recent uh, account of um, what makes government work. Um, so you have a results-oriented culture. Um, ensure positive management behaviours are spread across the organisation. Leadership is not just about the top, it's about everything. Professional leadership, it's about team leadership uh, and so on. It's absolutely critical. Uh, the final three are focus, focusing people on how to expand their capability. Not just their skill set, their capability. If all they do, it can be encompassed within an Excel spreadsheet every day. They're probably going to go out and work in 10 years' time. You know, when are they going to be replaced by an app? Um, uh, when are they, you know, when are they the taxi drivers of the next 20 years? An awful lot of public sector administrative workers are doing roles that we need to expand their capability um, because what they're doing is moving at a very fast pace. We have to mix people and teams so that they work creatively with the public to 
to solve the local problems. And crucially, we need to be honest in our self-assessment of where we are and have critical searching peers from other organisations um, examining us openly, independently, not just um, uh, cosily. Absolutely crucial. So I think the high performing councils are open, they're curious, they're innovative, and they're future focused. And I thought about this, this word open. We all want to live in a close community, but we don't want to live in a closed one. And the difference between close and closed is very, very important. And it's also the same in organisations. Um, we, openness is absolutely crucial. The leader's role, they are tribunes of the people, <coughs> not tribunes of the organisation. They're about opening the organisation, opening uh, the communities to wider opportunities. Um, this was Bill Clinton's triptych. He, he famously used to use this all the time um, uh, about the purpose of um, uh, public life. Um, I like this, a colleague of mine, American, another colleague of mine uses this, which is honour everyone's heritage, grasp today's opportunities, build a shared future together. Um, really, given the variety of heritage that people have, we need to honour everyone's heritage. We need to get what opportunities there are today, be strategically opportunistic, have insight, and uh, build a shared future together. So I leave you with some personal leadership challenges. Machiavelli said, whosoever desires constant success must change their conduct with the times. However, no man is so wise that he knows how to adapt his own nature. Both because he cannot deviate from the path to which his nature inclines him, and because he cannot be convinced to abandon the well-known path that's always brought him success by his following it. In other words, what got you to here you think might get you to there. It's unlikely. You need to adapt. We all need to adapt our nature and adapt our approach in order to move, take our organisations forward. Um, here is um, uh, a quick thing. I'll just quickly go through this. This is uh, politics and management, different rationalities. So here is activities, players, conversations, artefacts. So, Let's look at activities, imposing values and gaining, both positive and negative. Look at management, problem solving and careerism, both positive and negative. Look at players, representatives, experts, conversations are about what do you hear, it's about what do you know, about data, plans and reports, about passions, dreams and stories. Artifacts are intangible, they're, inter they're about symbols and what signify. Um, and management is about the tangible stuff. The currency of politics is stories. The currency of management is data. The dynamics of politics is conflict, compromise, and change. The dynamics of management is predictability, cooperation, and continuity. The thing is that people who are leaders and who are chief executives operate in the gap. They operate in both rationalities. They have to be able to translate across both. They are the bridge of the gap. You've got to understand the rationality of politics. You have to understand the rationality of management. Managers should not be stealing public interest political decisions. Politicians should not be meddling in management. The thing is, you've got to decide yourself in your own locality what that's about, what that means. And it means different things in different places. So political leaders spend less time in the iron cage of meetings, should explain new realities simply with honesty, Offer real hope by accentuating positives. Connect political change to local social changes. Help others to tone down their partisanship. The political leaders are the least partisan. They need to help others to tone down their partisanship. The managerial leaders don't steal political decisions. They do the same two things. They explain new realities simply. They offer hope by accentuating positives. They connect organisational change to economic change and they hope, help others tone down their professional expertise. Yeah. Your leaders and chief executives are the interlocutors uh, for organisations and communities um, and need to work together. 
If you can't inspire yourself, you'll never be able to inspire anyone else. So find ways to inspire yourself. Because if you can't, uh, just think about this. What do people say about you when you've left the room? It's absolutely critical. You're able to find ways to inspire people. And to do that, you first need to inspire yourself. Um, this is something that I'm personally proud of. I tried to think, well, what am I proud of? And I thought, here's some evidence at last. Um, we ask people this, I trust the Ocean Council to make the best decision for the borough to hold, even if I personally disagree with the decision. And I'm proud that only 14% disagree. And that was four months ago. Um, and we're now working on this because we think trustworthiness of local government is the most critical thing. Um, how can we act in a way that's trustworthy? Not how, how can we be trusted, because the only way we can be trusted is if we act trustworthily. So what does trustworthiness mean in different parts of our organisation? How do we do that? Um, and then I'll finally finish with this, which is um, David Foster Wallace um, uh, gave a commencement speech uh, to a graduation. Uh, it was appropriate. Um, and uh, in this commencement speech, he was talking really about the pressures of modern life and the way in which people are absorbed, self-absorbed in their own problems. Um, and what they needed to do was to consider the wider concerns. And he told the story of two fish uh, swimming along, and a larger fish went past. And the larger fish said to the two small fish, how's the water, boys? And the two small fish said, what is water? And the point of that, he said, was that the, often the most obvious and important realities are the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. The realities that we're operating in every day, the power relations or the changing nature of the communities we serve. But actually, the truth is that um, public servants add most value through the focused awareness of the needs of others. The focused awareness, not of their own needs, not of their own institution, but the needs of others. That's how we add value. And so we need to be aware of what's hidden in plain sight around us so that we keep reminding ourselves over and over again that what we're operating in is water. Thank you.